What did Silent Spring have to do with the environmental protection movement? The 1962 work by American ecologist Rachel Carson, 1907 to 1964, cautioned the world on the ill effects of chemicals on the environment. Carson argued that pollution and the use of chemicals, particularly pesticides, would result in less diversity of life. The best-selling book had wide influence, raising awareness of environmental issues and launching green. Environmental protection, movements in many industrialized nations. Why did the Hindenburg use hydrogen to keep afloat? The fact that Hindenburg used hydrogen might have been the airship's only flaw. And it was made necessary by the political climate of the time. Hindenburg was the fulfillment of German airship designer Hugo Eckener, 1868-1954. Whose Zeppelin company had enjoyed years of experience and success even as other airship companies folded. By 1934 Eckener felt that his successful Graf Zeppelin, which had made several transatlantic trips, was not well suited to such long-distance flights. Eckener envisioned a larger and speedier vessel. In the Hindenburg, which took her maiden flight on March 4, 1936, Eckener's vision was made real. Named for the German war hero and politician Paul von Hindenburg, 1847-1934. The immense airship measured 803 feet in length and had a diameter of 135 feet. Allowing it to hold nearly twice as much gas as other airships. The vessel was equipped with the latest technology including four Daimler-Benz diesel engines that allowed it to travel as fast as 85 miles per hour. Hindenburg was also a luxury liner, it featured private cabins, showers, dining room, promenade decks, picture windows, and even a pressurized and sealed smoking room. Cigarettes, pipes, and cigars had to be lit using an electric lighter. Matches were strictly forbidden on board. But there was one problem, Hindenburg had been designed to be lifted by helium. However, the gas was scarce at the time, and the United States refused to sell any to Germany which had been taken over by national extremist Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945. The American government suspected the Germans might soon have military plans for their airships. Thus, the Hindenburg was forced to use hydrogen 7 million cubic feet of the flammable gas. How did ancient societies interpret catastrophic weather events? Different cultures developed wholly unscientific explanations for dramatic weather events or other. Natural phenomena explanations typically rooted in the existing mythology or folklore of its people. For example, the ancient Maya, in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula and in parts of Central America, believed that earthquakes were the gods' way of thinning out an overcrowded population. 
Indians in central Mexico are believed to have worshipped. The grasshopper or locust after swarms destroy their crops. One Japanese myth maintained that the entire island string rested on the back of a giant catfish. Who would grow restless and flop around when the gods were displeased, resulting in an earthquake. According to Hawaiian myth, the volcano goddess Pele causes Mount Kilauea to erupt whenever she has a temper tantrum. How do the 2004 Southeast Asia tsunamis rank among natural disasters? The Southeast Asia tsunamis killed more people than any tsunami ever recorded. The series of seismic waves that rushed across the Indian Ocean on December 26, 2004 caused damage of biblical proportions and prompted a humanitarian rescue and aid effort on an unprecedented scale. That morning a 9.0 earthquake occurred off the northwestern tip of the island of Sumatra, Indonesia. Witnesses to the tsunamis reported that following the earthquake, ocean waters receded from shorelines hours before the giant waves roared in. Washing over islands and sweeping through coastal villages in 12 countries, including Indonesia, Myanmar, India, and Sri Lanka. The waves struck as far west as the coast of Africa. More than 150,000 people died in the disaster, Indonesia's death toll alone surpassed 85. 000 the international response was immediate and reached into the billions of dollars. Nonetheless relief efforts were hampered by remote island locations. The destruction of infrastructure, and ongoing conflicts in some areas. In the weeks following the tsunamis, officials recognized that the true death toll would take time to be known. Since survivors had yet to be interviewed about relatives and friends who remained missing. It was expected that many had been washed out to sea and thus had not. Been counted in the initial death toll, which was based on body counts. A preliminary report from the World Bank put the damages at $4.5 billion in Indonesia alone. But officials acknowledged that it would take months to calculate damages. The earthquake that struck the morning of December 26, 2004, was the third biggest earthquake in the past 100 years. And the biggest since 1964, when a 9.2 magnitude tembler occurred off Alaska. Scientists believe that the Southeast Asia quake occurred about 6.2 miles beneath the ocean floor and caused a great protrusion in the seabed, generating waves that moved across the ocean in the early morning hours. Though probably not huge when they were out at sea, the waves grew higher as they approached shore. As tremendous volumes of water were forced to the surface. What is the Kyoto Protocol? It is an environmental agreement signed by 141 nations that agree to work to slow global warming by limiting emissions. Cutting them by 5.2% by 2012. Each nation has its own target to meet. The protocol was drawn up December 11, 
1997, in the ancient capital of Kyoto, Japan. And went into effect on February 16, 2005. The United States is not among the signatories. American officials said the agreement is flawed because large developing countries including India and China were not immediately required to meet specific targets for reduction. Upon the protocol's enactment, Japan's Prime Minister called on non-signatory nations to rethink their participation. Saying that there was a need for a common framework to stop global warming. Environmentalists echoed his call to action. What were the worst earthquakes of the past century? In order of magnitude on the Richter scale they were, Chile, 1960, 9.5, Prince William Sound, Alaska. United States, 1964, 9.2, Andrinoff Islands, Alaska, United States, 1957, 9.1, Kamchatka, Northeast Russia. 1952, 9.0, off the coast of northern Sumatra, Indonesia, 2004, 9.0, off the west coast of Ecuador. 1906, 8.8, .8, Rat Islands, Alaska, United States, 1965, 8.7, Assam, India and Tibet. 1950, 8.6, Kamchatka, Northeast Russia, 1923, 8.5, Bundasi, Malay Archipelago, 1938, 8.5, and Kuril Islands. Off the east coast of Asia, extending from Russia in the north to Japan in the south, 1963, 8.5. What is the worst airplane accident in history? with thousands of accidents since the beginning of aviation history. Records differentiate among ground collision, mid-air collision, and single aircraft accidents. Some records differentiate by cause, including pilot error, weather, and fuel starvation. The worst ground collision and the deadliest airplane accident in History was the Tenerife disaster of March 27, 1977, which killed 583 people. Two Boeing 747 airliners ran into each other on Tenerife, in the Canary Islands, Atlantic Ocean. One was a Pan AM flight, the Clipper Victor, which originated at Los Angeles International Airport made a stop at New York's JFK Airport, and was headed for the Canary Islands. It was diverted to Tenerife at the last minute due to a bomb threat at its destination airport on neighboring Las Palmas Island. The other 747 was a KLM flight, the Flying Dutchman, originating in Amsterdam. It, too, was diverted to Las Palmas's Los Rodeos airport because of the threat there. On takeoff, the KLM plane slammed into the taxiing Pan AM plane. Heavy fog on the runway contributed to the disaster, but there were communication problems as well. According to Tower Records, the KLM flight had not yet been cleared for takeoff. Upon collision, 
the jumbo jets burst into flames, there were only 61 survivors. 54 passengers and 7 crew members, all from the Pan AM flight. The worst midair collision happened on November 12, 1996, over Charkadadri, India. 349 people perished when a Saudi Arabian Airlines Boeing 747 collided with a Kazakh Ilyushin IL-76 aircraft. There were no survivors. The worst single plane accident happened on August 12, 1985, when a Japan Airlines Boeing 747 crashed into a mountain on a domestic flight, killing 520 people, there were four survivors, all of them passengers. How did the civil rights movement begin? It began on Thursday, December 1, 1955, as Rosa Parks, 1913. A seamstress who worked for a downtown department store in Montgomery, Alabama, made her way home on the Cleveland Avenue bus. Parks was seated in the first row that was designated for blacks. But the white rows in the front of the bus soon filled up. When Parks was asked to give up her seat so that a white man could sit, she refused. She was arrested and sent to jail. Montgomery's black leaders had already been discussing staging a protest against racial segregation on the city buses. They soon organized, with Baptist minister Martin Luther King Jr. 1929-1968, as their leader. Beginning on December 5, 1955, thousands of black people refused to ride the city buses, the Montgomery bus boycott had begun. It lasted more than a year 382 days and ended only when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregation on the buses was unconstitutional. The protesters and civil rights activists had emerged the victors in this there. First and momentous effort to end segregation and discrimination in the United States. Parks, who lost her job as a result of the arrest later explained that she had acted on her own beliefs that she was being unfairly treated. But in so doing Parks had taken a stand and had given rise to a movement. Who started the Underground Railroad? American abolitionist, lecturer, and nurse Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, set up the network to emancipate slaves. Tubman was motivated to do so after she had made her way to freedom in 1849, and then wished the same for her family. I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. For the next ten years Tubman acted as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Making at least 15 trips into southern slave states. And guiding not only her parents and siblings, but more than 300 slaves to freedom in the north. She was called the Moses of her people for her emancipation efforts. The journeys to freedom were demanding and often dangerous missions. 
Though Tubman was small in stature, she possessed extraordinary leadership qualities. Author, clergyman, and army officer Thomas Wentworth Higginson. 1823-1911, called her the greatest heroine of the age. What happened to the Tacomaneros Bridge? In 1940, the new 2,800-foot suspension bridge carrying traffic across Washington's Puget Sound was hit by high winds, causing it to buckle and undulate. In the simplest of terms, an engineering error allowed one of the suspensions to give way in the wind. And the bridge became ribbon-like, moving in waves. It was ten years before a second span was opened over the body of water. The 1940 accident prompted engineers and bridge designers to be more cautious in the design of suspension bridges. The first wire suspension bridge in the U.S. was built in 1842, the 358-foot long and 25-foot wide bridge spanned the Schuylkill River, near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was supported by five wire cables on either side, and was built by U.S. civil engineer Charles Ellett, Jr. 1810 to 1862, the first chain suspension bridge in the U.S. was built in 1800. When was slavery outlawed in Europe? The slave trade ended in Britain in 1807, when authorities agreed with the growing number of abolitionists. Those who argued that slavery is immoral and violates Christian beliefs, and outlawed the trade. In 1833 slavery was abolished throughout the British colonies as the culmination of the great anti-slavery movement in Great Britain. In the United States, the slave trade was prohibited in 1808, but possessing slaves was still legal. Consequently, trade on the black market continued until Britain stepped up its enforcement of its anti-slavery law by conducting naval blockades and surprise raids off the African coast, effectively closing the trade. The slave trade as it had been known officially came to an end after 1870, when it was outlawed throughout the Americas. Throughout the world, the United Nations works to abolish slavery and other systems of forced labor. Who were the leaders of abolition? Leaders of the anti-slavery movement included journalist William Lloyd Garrison, 1805-1879 Founder of the influential anti-slavery journal The Liberator and of the American Anti-Slavery Society Established 1833, Brothers Arthur, 1786-1865, and Lewis, 1788-1873, Tappan Prominent New York merchants who were also founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and Theodore Dwight Weld. 1803-1895, leader of student protests, organizer of the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. 
and author of The Bible Against Slavery, 1837, and other abolitionist works. Underground Railroad Conductor Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, worked against slavery by helping to free hundreds of blacks who escaped slavery in the South. Heading for Northern States and Canada Writers such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, 1811-1896, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1851-52. Help strengthen the abolitionist cause and were instrumental in swaying public sentiment. In the hands of some activists, the movement became violent. In 1859 ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800-1859, led a raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry, in present-day West Virginia which proved a failed attempt to emancipate slaves by force. What effect did the sinking of the Titanic have on sea travel? The sinking of the Titanic brought about new regulations to increase the safety of sea travel. First, and perhaps most simply, all ships are required to carry enough lifeboats such that there is one spot for each person on board. When Titanic sailed, the number of required lifeboats was based on the ship's tonnage, not on the number of passengers and crew. Also, new rules required lifeboat drills to be held soon after a ship sails. Shipping lanes were moved farther south, away from the ice fields, and are monitored by a patrol. Ships approaching ice fields are required to slow their speed or alter their course. Until 1912 most ships employed only one wireless operator. Such was the case on the California, which was less than 20 miles from Titanic when wireless operator Jack Phillips sent out the distress signal. However, the operator on the California was not on duty at that hour. Phillips stayed at his station, desperately trying to reach a nearby ship and eventually went down with Titanic. In the aftermath of the disaster, the U.S. Congress moved quickly to pass the Radio Act of 1912, which required that radios be manned day and night, that they have an alternate energy source. Besides the ship's engine, and that they have a range of at least 100 miles. Further, operators must be licensed, adhere to certain bandwidths, and observe a strict protocol for receiving distress signals. This was the beginning of the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC. These measures were meant to rid the airwaves of those amateur operators who had confused official operators the night of April 15, 1912. One erroneous wireless message transmitted by amateurs that night had the Titanic moving safely toward Halifax, Nova Scotia. Why was the Titanic thought to be unsinkable? The RMS Titanic was state-of-the-art, a huge and luxurious ocean liner equipped with the latest and best. The ship's size afforded it great stability, 
its structure included more steel than had been used in previous ships. It was built with a double bottom both skins were heavier and thicker than those of other ships. The hull was divided by 15 bulkheads, upright partitions. That rose five decks forward and aft, back, and four decks midship. These transverse bulkheads divided the ship into 16 compartments watertight. Chambers any two of which could take on water without sinking the ship. This marvel of modern technology, which was to be the jewel in the crown of the White Star Line, was given a fitting name, Titanic is a Greek word meaning having great force or power. And it was described as practically unsinkable. However, the ship designer did not and could not prepare the ship for what happened on the night of April 14, 1912. Just before midnight, the Titanic was speeding at 21 knots through the North Atlantic. Even though the crew had been warned by other ships that the unusually calm waters were full of ice. When the Titanic's two watchmen, who were not using binoculars, sighted an iceberg in the ship's path, it was only a quarter mile away. The ship was turned to the port, left, but it was too late. The underwater shelf of the ice tore through the plating on the starboard, right, side of the ship. Thin slits developed at the seams in the ship's hull, allowing seawater to enter. The effect was similar to filling an ice tray with water, once one watertight chamber had filled. The rushing water spilled over the top and into the next. Titanic came to symbolize human arrogance. The ship owners and operators believed the Titanic was impervious to nature. Consequently, the ocean liner had not been equipped with the number of lifeboats needed to rescue everyone on board. Titanic's lifeboats had room for about half the passengers. Since there had been no safety drills on board, many lifeboats were launched only half full. The enormous loss of life, which included society's most prominent individuals as well as ordinary families who were immigrating to America, stands out as one of the great tragedies in the history of transportation. How frequently have tsunamis occurred throughout the world? Tsunamis typically occur about every six years in the Pacific Ocean. And most often during March, August, and November. Although sometimes called tidal waves, Tsunamis are created not by tides but by seismic movements. Earthquakes, which produce chains of waves that move across the water at terrific speeds of more than 500 miles per hour. Upon reaching shallow water, the waves grow in height, sometimes to 100 feet or more. As was the case in 1883 when tsunamis reaching up to 130 feet hit an Indonesian island. Destroying more than 150 villages and claiming some 36,000 lives. In ancient times, it is believed that a tsunami destroyed the Minoan Greek culture. That of a people who lived on the island of Crete, in the Mediterranean Sea.
In about 1450 BC Crete was struck by a 200-foot tsunami, which either demolished the island or weakened the population such that they could be taken over by the Mycenaeans, who were Greek mainlanders. While tsunamis are known to strike along the Pacific Rim, Damage has been minimized by sophisticated instruments that help meteorologists monitor and predict disastrous weather. Alerting the public to evacuate from areas of possible danger. Such systems did not exist for the Indian Ocean when a 9.0 earthquake off. The coast of the Indonesian island of Sumatra struck on December 26, 2004. What are the largest known volcanic eruptions in history? Scientists measure volcanic eruptions by the amount of material that a volcano ejects into the atmosphere. Based on this measurement system, the largest eruptions include, in descending order of strength, one at Yellowstone Park in the United States, c. 600,000 BC, another at Toba, Indonesia. About 74,000 BC, a Tambora, Indonesia, eruption in AD 1815, Santorini, Greece, in 1470 BC. Laki, Iceland, in AD 1783, which also produced the largest known lava flow in recorded history. And another in Indonesia, at Krakato, in AD 1883. The eruption in Yellowstone is hard to fathom. The volcano, which would have been located in present-day Wyoming, left a crater that measures 30 by 45 miles and released about 10,000 cubic kilometers of material into the atmosphere. To put this into perspective, consider that the next largest eruption, that at Toba, released one-tenth that amount, or 1,000 cubic kilometers. The one at Tambora released one-tenth of the Toba amount, 100 cubic kilometers. All of the others released about 10 cubic kilometers of earth debris into the atmosphere. The May 18, 1980, eruption of Mount St. Helens in southwestern Washington state is also considered among the largest known eruptions in history and is the largest eruption in the modern history of the 48 contiguous United States. Mount St. Helens released a comparatively small amount of material. One cubic kilometer, but the damage was great after the volcano erupted. Much of the region was blanketed in ash, miles of forest were devastated. And the north fork of the Tootle River was laden with ash and other volcanic debris up to 600 feet deep. The eruption claimed 57 lives. Who was Emmett Till? Emmett Till, 1941-1955, was a black 14-year-old from Chicago who was brutally mutilated and killed in the Deep South in August 1955. The young man was visiting relatives in Mississippi when he allegedly whistled at a white female store clerk. Till was sharing a bed with his 12-year-old cousin when two white men 
came to get him on the morning of August 28, he was not seen alive again. His body was later found in a river, tied to a cotton gin fan with barbed wire. An all-white jury acquitted the store clerk's husband, Roy Bryant, and half-brother. J.W. Millman, of the crime. The events stirred anger in the black community. And among civil rights proponents in general, setting off the civil rights movement. For four decades, Till's grisly murder continued to deeply trouble many. Who believed justice could still be served. Though no one was ever convicted of the crime, and the two men who were tried for it had. By 2005, died, some of Till's family and friends. As well as investigators, believed others who participated in the lynching might still be alive. In a quest for clues, Till's body was disinterred in June 2005 to gather evidence. He was reburied in a quiet funeral. The Till family hoped the pending investigation would yield answers and justice. Were activists the only ones who were vocal about opposing segregation? No, segregation was opposed at every level of black society, as well as by many whites. The voices of the civil rights movement included wage laborers, farmers, educators, athletes. Entertainers, soldiers, religious leaders, politicians, and statesmen all of whom had experienced the oppression of Jim Crow laws and policies in the United States before W.E.B. Du Bois. 1868-1963, rose to prominence as an educator and writer, he chose to leave the security of his home in Great Barrington. Massachusetts, to attend college at Nashville's Fisk University. There, in 1885, he encountered Tennessee's Jim Crow laws, which strictly divided blacks and whites. He was so intimidated by the Southern system that he rarely left the campus. And he ultimately returned to New England to complete his studies at Harvard University. He did, however, go back to the South. Becoming a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University, 1897-1910, 1932-44. As one of the first exponents of full and equal racial equality. In 1909 Dubois helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. NAACP, which provided leadership during the civil rights movement. In 1942 a young Georgia man named John Roosevelt Robinson, 1919-1972, was drafted into the military. Robinson applied for officer's candidate school at Fort Riley, Kansas. And although he was admitted to the program, he and the other black candidates received no training until pressure from Washington. D.C. forced the local commander to admit blacks to the base's training school. Later Robinson became a second lieutenant and continued to challenge the Jim Crow policies on military bases. When the Army decided to keep him out of a game with the nearby University of Missouri because that school refused to play against a team with black members, Robinson quit the base's football team in protest. 
At Fort Hood, Texas, Robinson objected to segregation on an army bus. His protests led to court martial. Acquitted, in November 1944, Robinson was honorably discharged before the end of World War II. 1939 to 45, the army had no desire to keep this black agitator among the ranks. And, as Robinson later put it, he was pretty much fed up with the service. In 1947 Jackie Robinson became the first black baseball player in the major leagues. When he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers, breaking the color barrier in the national pastime. In the post-war years, American diplomat Ralph Bunch, 1904 to 1971, attracted public attention when he rejected an offer from President Harry Truman, 1884 to 1972, to become an Assistant Secretary of State. Bunch, a Howard University professor who had worked for the Office of Strategic Services during the war, explained that he declined the position because he did not want to subject his family to the Jim Crow laws of Washington. D.C. Bunch spoke out frequently against racism. And in 1944 he co-authored the book An American Dilemma, which examined the plight of American blacks. These are just a few of the many examples of personal protest that signaled the beginning of the civil rights movement in the United States. Were there any other airship disasters before Hindenburg? Yes, as Hugo Eckener, 1868 to 1954, and his Zeppelin company laid plans in 1934 to build the large and luxurious Hindenburg. Most other nations with airship programs had either abandoned them or were about to. Since all had experienced disastrous and fatal crashes. One of these was when a British dirigible R101 burned on October 5, 1930. Northwest of Paris while on her maiden voyage to Australia. That disaster claimed 54 lives. What did the founding of Liberia have to do with the anti slavery movement? with the goal of transporting freed slaves back to their homeland. Members of the American Colonization Society, organized 1816-17, made land purchases on the West African coast. The holdings were named Liberia, a Latin word meaning freedom. The first black Americans arrived there in 1822 but the society's plan was controversial. Even some abolitionists and blacks opposed it, as they believed the only answer to the question of slavery was to eradicate it from the United States and extend the full rights of citizenship to the freed slaves in their new American home. Nevertheless, by 1860 11,000 freed black slaves from the United States had been settled there. Eventually a total of 15,000 made the transatlantic voyage to a secured freedom in Liberia. The country was established as an independent republic on July 26, 1847. What was the most damaging earthquake in recent history?
it was a July 28, 1976, quake that rocked the Chinese city of Tangshan at 4 o'clock in the morning. In less than a minute, 89% of the homes and 78% of the industrial buildings were destroyed. Killing 250,000 people, according to the official reports. However, international observers believe the death toll was even higher, about 750,000. Which means that the quake claimed three-fourths of the area's total population. A quake had not occurred in that region in six centuries. And the area was considered to be at low risk for earthquakes. Consequently, the building codes in the region were not stringent. Enough for the structures to withstand the force of the quake. Why did President Lincoln issue the Emancipation Proclamation before the end of the Civil War? As the war raged between the Confederacy and the Union, it looked like victory would be a long time in the making. In the summer of 1862 things seemed grim for the Federal troops when they were defeated at the Second Battle of Bull Run, which took place in northeastern Virginia on August 29-30. But on September 17, with the Battle of Antietam, in Maryland, the Union finally forced the Confederates to withdraw across the Potomac into Virginia. That September day was the bloodiest of the war. President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, decided that this withdrawal was success enough for him to make his proclamation. And on September 22, he called a cabinet meeting. That day he presented to his advisors the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The official Emancipation Proclamation was issued later. On January 1, 1863. This final version differed from the preliminary one in that it specified emancipation was to be effected only in those states that were in rebellion, i.e. the South. This key change had been made because the President's proclamation was based on congressional acts giving him authority to confiscate rebel property and forbidding the military from returning slaves of rebels to their owners. Abolitionists in the North criticized the president for limiting the scope of the edict to those states in rebellion, for it left open the question of how slaves and slave owners in the loyal, northern, states should be dealt with. Nevertheless, Lincoln had made a stand, which served to change the scope of the Civil War, 1861-65, to a war against slavery. On January 31, 1865, just over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, banning slavery throughout the United States. Lincoln, who had lobbied hard for this amendment, was pleased with its passage. The Confederate states did not free their four million slaves. Until after the Union was victorious, on April 9, 1865. How damaging were the California wildfires of 2003?
The wildfires that raged in Southern California in late 2003 were the most damaging in the state's history. Fifteen fires destroyed 3,000 homes, burned 750,000 acres, caused more than 200 injuries, and claimed 24 lives. The fires produced one of the worst disasters the state had ever seen. The wildfires began October 21st and, driven by Santa Ana winds, swept through wooded canyons and mountain communities in Los Angeles, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Ventura counties. On October 27, President Bush declared a disaster area, clearing the way for federal assistance. Firefighters worked into early November to bring the blazes under control. The fires had forced mandatory evacuations and caused widespread air pollution. Damages were estimated between $2.50 and $3 billion. Although Southern California was devastated by the emergency, and the western wildfires were in the national headlines, the 2003 fire season was, on the whole, about average. According to the National Interagency Fire Center, NIFC, 85,943 fires burned in U.S. wildlands during the 2003 season, the 10-year average, 1993-2002, was 101,575 fires per season. The number of acres burned in 2003 was 4,918,088, with a 10-year average of 4,663,081 acres per season. The 2004 fire season burned almost 2 million acres more than in 2003. But the NIFC acknowledged that the number of structures destroyed was above average in 2003, a total of 5,781 structures were burned. Including 4,090 primary residences, leaving many homeless. Federal agencies alone spent $1.3 billion to suppress wildfires across. The United States in 2003 considerably higher than the 10-year average. Is there slavery today? Yes, slavery continues into the 21st century. The United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, has stated. Although slavery has been formally abolished from the world, the trade in human misery continues. Today it is called human trafficking. Estimating the size of the problem is difficult. But the UNFPA estimates that about 4 million people are trafficked across international borders each year. The group also reports that the problem is widespread. But the greatest volume of human trafficking exists in Asia, with Africa and Latin America following close behind. The Asia Pacific region is seen as particularly vulnerable. According to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNESCAP, because of its huge population pyramid, growing urbanization, and extensive poverty, some human rights groups estimate that the number of slaves in the world today is as high as 27 million people. And experts say that it is a growing problem, fueled by globalization. Men, women, and children, 
especially in developing countries. Are forced into labor in sweatshops and fields, and into prostitution in brothels. In desperately poor regions of the world, families sell their children into slave labor and forced prostitution. Other victims are lured in, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. From Himalayan villages to Eastern European cities, people especially women and girls are Attracted by the prospect of a well-paid job as a domestic servant, waitress, or factory worker. Traffickers recruit victims through fake advertisements. Mail-order bride catalogs, and casual acquaintances. But the victims end up in situations controlled by their traffickers and they are exploited against their wills to earn illicit revenues. By the early 2000s, human rights groups and governments were organizing to combat the increase in human trafficking. Several agencies of the United Nations worked to address the roots of the problem and to aid victims. Non-government agencies were playing a role as well. One such group is Shared Hope International. Founded in 1998 by U.S. Congresswoman Linda Smith, Washington. To rescue and restore women and children in crisis by providing comprehensive services to meet their needs. Italy's government was at the forefront of the anti-trafficking movement. Offering residency permits to victims and funding local shelters through legislation passed. In 1999. In 2000 the US Congress passed the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. TVPA, declaring that sex trafficking is the modern day slavery. Government figures estimated that each year 45,000 to 50,000 women and children were trafficked into the United States. Where they were trapped in modern-day slavery-like situations such as forced prostitution. But the trafficking problem in the United States, and elsewhere, is not limited to importing women and children from other countries. According to a September 2001 Justice Department report, 400 000 children are lured or forced into prostitution each year in the United States. Many of the victims are from white, working and middle class families. Often runaways from troubled homes who end up on the streets. In September 2004 former Representative John R. Miller, Washington, was sworn into the newly created position of Ambassador at Large for the U.S. State Department's Anti-Trafficking Office. In a speech, Miller said, Today, the slavery is not on plantations and in homes. It is in factories and armies as well, and especially in brothels. But the slave masters use the same tools today as earlier slave masters, kidnapping, fraud, threats, and beatings, all aimed at forcing women, children, and men into labor and sex exploitation. Experts agreed that ending human trafficking in the 21st century would require a coalition of government. Special interest groups, human rights organizations, and other non-government organizations. Determining the scope of the problem and raising public awareness were important first steps.
What are the facts about the Titanic? As the brainchild of Lord William James Perry and J. Bruce Ismay, Titanic was a marriage of British technology and American money. Perry was head of Harland and Wolfe, a firm known for building the sturdiest and best ships in the British Isles. Ismay was chairman of the White Star Line, owned by American financier J. Pierpont Morgans, 1837-1913, International Mercantile Marine. In 1907 Paris and Ismay came up with a plan to compete with the top-notch Cunard liners by surpassing them both in size and luxury. The ship they planned, Titanic, was built in Belfast along with her sister ship. Olympic, which Titanic exceeded in gross tonnage but not in length. Titanic was 882 feet long, 92 feet wide, and weighed 46,328 gross tons. Nine steel decks rose as high as an 11-story building. Registered as a British ship and manned by British officers. Titanic was launched on May 31, 1911. The ship was everything Paris and Ismay had planned. Titanic's size not only allowed more room to accommodate the increasing number of steerage. Cheapest fare, passengers who were immigrating to the United States. But also featured lavish elegance for first and second class travelers. Creature comforts included the first shipboard swimming pool, Turkish bath, gymnasium, and squash court. First-class cabins were nothing short of opulent. Including coal-burning fireplaces in the sitting rooms and full-size, four-poster beds in the bedrooms. Additionally, there was a loading crane and a compartment for automobiles. The ship's hospital even featured a modern operating room. With her steerage full and some of society's most prominent individuals on board. The RMS Titanic left the docks at Southampton, England, on April 10, 1912. New York Harbor was her final destination. On April 14, the ship was traveling in the exceptionally calm and icy waters of the North Atlantic. Near Newfoundland. At 11.40 p.m., Titanic scraped an iceberg. Sustaining damage along the starboard, right, side, from the bow to about midship. The Titanic, which immediately began taking on water. Sank in 2 hours and 40 minutes in the early morning hours of April 15. Only 711 of the 2,224 aboard survived. The 1,513 lost included American industrialists and businessmen John Jacob Astor IV. Isidore Strauss, of R. H. Macy's, Benjamin Guggenheim, and Harry Elkins Widener. Survivors mostly women and children who had been traveling as first-class passengers were picked up by the Carpathia. Which was 58 miles away when it received Titanic's distress signals. It took three and a half hours for Carpathia to reach the site of the disaster. By which time the Titanic was gone. What happened on Apollo 13?
On April 13, 1970, a damaged coil caused an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks on the moonbound U. S. spacecraft, leaving astronauts Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes in a disastrous situation. The explosion damaged the fuel cells as well the craft's heat shield, which was needed to protect the vessel upon re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. While the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, had experienced a previous disaster in 1967, when three astronauts died in a fire on the launch pad mission control had not faced anything like this before. And no Americans had ever been lost in space. After hearing a loud bang and seeing an oxygen tank empty, the Apollo 13 astronauts reported to mission control at the Johnson Space Center, OK, Houston, we've had a problem. The ensuing real-life drama proved that to be an understatement. The crew moved into the craft's tiny lunar module, designed to keep two men alive for just two days. With the astronauts four days from home, NASA engineers had their work cut out for them. Among other measures, the temperature in the module was lowered. To 38 degrees Fahrenheit to conserve oxygen and electricity. The world was waiting and watching as the module splashed down in the South Pacific. Just barely ahead of the failure of the oxygen. All three astronauts survived the disaster, which came to be known as the successful failure. Apollo 13 never reached its destination but, despite the odds, made it back to Earth safely. When did the anti-slavery movement begin? In the United States, the campaign to prohibit slavery strengthened in the early 1800s. Across the Atlantic, abolitionists had successfully lobbied for the outlaw of slave trade in Great Britain by 1807. The following year, the U.S. government also outlawed the trade, but possession of slaves remained legal and profitable. In the 1830s the call to abolish slavery and emancipate slaves became an active movement in the United States. Precipitated by a revival of evangelical religion in the North. Abolitionists, believing slavery is morally wrong and violates Christian beliefs. Called for an end to the system, which had become critical to the agrarian economy of the southern states where plantations produced cotton, tobacco, and other crops for domestic and international markets. What did lawmakers do to resolve the slavery question before the Civil War? The mid-1800s were a trying time for the nation the divide widened between the northern free states and the southern slave states, which were growing increasingly dependent on agricultural slave labor. Government tried but was unable to bring resolution to the conflict over slavery. Instead, its efforts seemed geared toward maintaining the delicate north-south political balance in the nation. After the Mexican War, 1846-48, the issue was front and center as congressmen. 
considered whether slavery should be extended into Texas and the Western territories. Gained in the Peace Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which officially ended the war. Lawmakers arrived at the Compromise of 1850, which proved a poor attempt to assuage mounting tensions. The legislation allowed for Texas to be admitted to the Union as a slave state. California to be admitted as a free state, slavery was prohibited, voters in New Mexico and Utah to decide the slavery question themselves. A method called popular sovereignty, the slave trade to be prohibited in Washington. D.C., and for passage of a strict fugitive slave law to be enforced nationally. Four years later, as it considered how to admit Kansas and Nebraska to the Union. Congress reversed an earlier decision, part of the Missouri Compromise of 1820, that had declared the territories north of the Louisiana Purchase to be free, and set up a dangerous situation in the new states. The slavery status of Kansas and Nebraska would be decided by popular sovereignty, the voters in each state. Nebraska was settled mostly by people opposing slavery, but settlers from both the north and the south poured into Kansas. Which became the setting for violent conflicts between pro slavery and anti slavery forces. Both sides became determined to swing the vote by sending squatters to settle the land. Conflicts resulted, with most of them clustered around the Kansas border with Missouri, where slavery was legal. In one incident, on May 24, 1856, ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800-1859, led a massacre in which five pro-slavery men were brutally murdered as they slept. The act had been carried out in retribution for earlier killings of freemen at Lawrence. Kansas, Brown claimed his was a mission of God. Newspapers dubbed the series of deadly conflicts, which eventually claimed more than 50 lives, bleeding Kansas. The situation proved that neither congressional compromises nor the doctrine of popular sovereignty would solve the nation's deep ideological differences. What is the strongest earthquake ever measured? It was one that shook Chile on May 22, 1960, it measured 9.5 on the Richter scale. 2,000 died, 3,000 were injured, and 2 million were left homeless. Damage was $550 million. The quake also spawned tsunamis, seismic waves, which claimed 61 lives in Hawaii, 138 in Japan, and 32 dead or missing in the Philippines. What was the Niagara Movement? It was a short-lived but important African-American organization that advocated the total integration of blacks into mainstream society. With all the rights, privileges, and benefits of other Americans. Founded in Niagara Falls, Ontario, in 1905, the Niagara Movement was led by writer, scholar, and activist W.E.B. Dubois 
1868-1963, who was then a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University. Observers described the organization as the anti-Bukharite camp, educator Booker T. Washington, 1856-1915, who rose from slavery to found Alabama's Tuskegee Institute. 1881, believed change for black people should be effected through education and self-improvement not through demand. Mr. Washington opposed the social and political agitation favored by some reformers. The Niagara Movement, on the other hand, placed the responsibility for the nation's racial problems squarely on the shoulders of its white population. The 30 branches of the Niagara Movement challenged conservative politics of the so-called Tuskegee. Machine led by Booker T. Washington. Though the Niagara organization dissolved in 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People NAACP, was heir to its ideology and activism. Dubois helped found that organization, and from 1910 to 1934 edited its official journal, The Crisis, in which he published his views on nearly every important social issue that confronted the black community. What happened to Challenger? On January 28, 1986, at Cape Canaveral, Florida, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, launched the 25th mission of its Space Shuttle program. The Challenger carried a crew of seven, including Krista McAuliffe. 1948-1986, who was to be the first schoolteacher in space. She was slated to broadcast a series of lessons to school children throughout America. The crew's commander was Francis Scobby, 1939-1986 who had piloted a 1984 shuttle mission. The pilot was Michael Smith, 1945-1986, who was making his first flight in space, mission specialists Ellison Onizuka. 1946-1986, Ronald McNair, 1950-1986, and Judith Resnick, 1949-1986, were all experienced space travelers. And payload specialist Gregory Jarvis, 1944-1986, was making his first space flight. That cold and clear January morning, the Challenger's takeoff was delayed by two hours. Freezing temperatures overnight had produced ice on the shuttle and launch pad which prompted NASA to conduct inspections to assess the condition of the craft. At 11.38 a.m., Challenger was launched into space. Just 73 seconds later and at an altitude of 48. 000 feet the craft still in view of the spectators on the ground Challenger burst into flames. While NASA controllers were aware of what had happened, they had, among other things, heard Smith utter. Uh-oh, just one second prior to the explosion, it took a moment for the spectators to understand. But as the fireball grew bigger and debris scattered, the spectators, including family and friends of the crew, fell silent. The crew, inside a module that detached from the shuttle during the blow-up. 
evidently survived the explosion but died upon impact after a nine-mile free fall into the Atlantic Ocean. Six weeks after the disaster, the crew module was recovered from the ocean floor. All seven astronauts were buried with full honors. Investigations into the crash revealed that the O-rings, seals, on the shuttle's solid rocket boosters had failed to work, due to the low temperatures. The O-rings had stiffened and thereby lost their ability to act as a seal. A government commission recommended a complete redesign of the solid rocket booster joints. A review of the astronaut escape systems, to work toward achieving greater safety margins. Regulation of the rate of shuttle flights to maximize safety. And a sweeping reform of the shuttle program's management structure. The space agency retrenched. It was almost three years later on September 29, 1988 before another American shuttle flew in space. What happened to Challenger? On January 28, 1986, at Cape Canaveral, Florida, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, launched the 25th mission of its space shuttle program. The Challenger carried a crew of seven, including Krista McAuliffe. 1948-1986 who was to be the first school teacher in space. She was slated to broadcast a series of lessons to school children throughout America. The crew's commander was Francis Scobby, 1939-1986, who had piloted a 1984 shuttle mission. The pilot was Michael Smith, 1945-1986, who was making his first flight in space, mission specialists Ellis and Onizuka. 1946-1986, Ronald McNair, 1950-1986, and Judith Resnick, 1949-1986, were all experienced space travelers. And payload specialist Gregory Jarvis, 1944-1986, was making his first space flight. That cold and clear January morning, the Challenger's takeoff was delayed by two hours. Freezing temperatures overnight had produced ice on the shuttle and launch pad, which prompted NASA to conduct inspections to assess the condition of the craft. At 11.38 a.m., Challenger was launched into space. Just 73 seconds later and at an altitude of 48. 000 feet the craft still in view of the spectators on the ground Challenger burst into flames. While NASA controllers were aware of what had happened, they had, among other things, heard Smith utter. Uh oh, just one second prior to the explosion, it took a moment for the spectators to understand. But as the fireball grew bigger and debris scattered, the spectators, including family and friends of the crew, fell silent. The crew, inside a module that detached from the shuttle during the blow-up, Evidently survived the explosion but died upon impact after a nine mile free fall into the Atlantic Ocean. Six weeks after the disaster, the crew module was recovered from the ocean floor. All seven astronauts were buried with full honors. 
Investigations into the crash revealed that the O-rings, seals on the shuttle's solid rocket boosters had failed to work, due to the low temperatures. The O-rings had stiffened and thereby lost their ability to act as a seal. A government commission recommended a complete redesign of the solid rocket booster joints. A review of the astronaut escape systems, to work toward achieving greater safety margins. Regulation of the rate of shuttle flights to maximize safety. And a sweeping reform of the shuttle program's management structure. The space agency retrenched. It was almost three years later on September 29, 1988 before another American shuttle flew in space. Is it true that the engineers of the Challenger's O-rings warned NASA that the devices might fail? Yes, but sadly the advice of the engineers went unheeded, the O-ring manufacturer, Morton Thiokol, gave the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the go-ahead in the hours before Challenger's takeoff. On January 27, 1986, the night before the planned takeoff, the temperature at Cape Canaveral, Florida, dropped to well below freezing. Since no shuttle had been launched in temperatures below 53 degrees Fahrenheit, NASA undertook a late-night review to determine launch readiness. As a contractor, Morton Thiokol participated in this process. With their engineers expressing concerns about the O-rings on the shuttle's solid rocket boosters. They feared the rings would stiffen in the cold temperatures and lose their ability to act as a seal. Since the space agency was under pressure to launch the shuttle on schedule, NASA managers pushed the manufacturer for a go or no go decision. The managers of Thiokol, who were aware that the O rings had never been tested at such low temperatures, signed a waiver stating that the solid rocket boosters were safe for launch at the colder temperatures. Challenger was launched the next morning, at 11.38 a.m., about one minute into the flight. A flame became evident, and seconds later, the spacecraft exploded. All seven crew members died. Investigators later concluded that the tragic accident had been caused by the failure of the O-rings. Is it true that the engineers of the Challenger's O-rings warned NASA that the devices might fail? Yes, but sadly the advice of the engineers went unheeded, the O-ring manufacturer, Morton Thiokol, gave the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the go-ahead in the hours before Challenger's takeoff. On January 27, 1986, the night before the planned takeoff, the temperature at Cape Canaveral, Florida, dropped to well below freezing. Since no shuttle had been launched in temperatures below 53 degrees Fahrenheit, NASA undertook a late-night review to determine launch readiness. As a contractor, Morton Thiokol participated in this process. With their engineers expressing concerns about the O-rings on the shuttle's solid rocket boosters. 
they feared the rings would stiffen in the cold temperatures and lose their ability to act as a seal. Since the space agency was under pressure to launch the shuttle on schedule, NASA managers pushed the manufacturer for a go or no go decision. The managers of Thiokol, who were aware that the O-rings had never been tested at such low temperatures, signed a waiver stating that the solid rocket boosters were safe for launch at the colder temperatures. Challenger was launched the next morning, at 11.38 a.m., about one minute into the flight. A flame became evident, and seconds later, the spacecraft exploded. All seven crew members died. Investigators later concluded that the tragic accident had been caused by the failure of the O-rings.